So our next speaker this morning is Dr. Ken Johnson. Ken is a professor of plant pathology with Oregon State University. Um, he's been working on fire blight for many years, and I was very excited to see this recent summary he put together of the non-antibiotic information he's been working on for organic growers. And so I asked him to please share that with us, and um, we'll have some time for, for questions after his talk. Thank you, Ken. Well, she packed a lot in and I don't, I think I could skip a few slides now. That'll be fine. <laughs> um, uh, happy to be up here. Um, if you all remember back, back last spring, it was kind of cold and wet and I had the worst time I've ever had working on fire blight. And so uh, for me, that was terrible. But I, if there was a blessing of the cold and wet last spring, I hope it cleaned up all your orchards. So <laughs> um, uh, let's see, here we go. Forward, back, all right. Uh, we're just gonna review the organic practices for fire blight. Um, it's not as easy, right? So, uh, and we were just, the coddling moth talk this morning, they said that organic seems to be on the increase. So we'll we'll go over this, the materials here for this. Um, and I can probably skip a few slides, as I said, because Tiana, Tiana hit a whole bunch of them. So, you know, here's, here's kind of my abbreviated slide of that whole thing she had. So uh, overwintering in the cankers, the, what we call the floral epiphytic phase where it builds up in the flowers and then gives us a few infections. And then the summer phases where we kind of have to chase them down with, with copper or, or, or something like that. So um, there's that slide. So I think you just got that talk. Um, so in organics, you know, our, our choices are limited and I'm, I've sort of got them slotted in on the spots where I think that they're mostly used and I'll talk more about them. But um, Tiana mentioned fixed copper sanitation at delayed dormant as an important tool. It helps. I can show you the data here in a second. Lime sulfur for thinning as the way Harold Austinson used to talk about it fairly early, King Bloom. Um, pretty good on, on blight at that point, doesn't mess with like putting on your yeast or anything. So if you're, if you're in that mode of using lime sulfur for thinning, those early timings are the best fit with, with, with the, with the yeast programs. I know with like honey crisp and, uh, um, or maybe pink ladies or things like that, that the, the lime sulfur has kind of been moving around a little bit, uh, in the bloom period. And anytime you put lime sulfur on the trees and you, and you've already put blossom protect on, you pretty much are smashing on it. So and as Tiana said, you wanna put your yeast back on again if, if, if you have time to do that. And then, um, you know, during during the latter half of bloom, and Tiana talked about this, that we have these choices of materials, which, which I'll make a few comments about. Okay. Um, this is an old slide of mine. It's a study I did with about 10 years ago with uh, Rachel Elkins in California, but you know, you can see those kind of hump baked, humped curves in the, in, the, in the panels there. And that's sort of like how many flowers have you got open in the orchard? Uh, and then the black lines coming up. And that was when we could actually find the fire blight pathogen in the flowers. So when you get up to early bloom, it's not in there yet. It's working on it, but it's not in there yet, at least not in big numbers. And as the bloom goes on, it builds up. And so when you get out closer to petal fall in, in, in an orchard, in a commercial orchard situation, that's when you're gonna to start to have numbers. That doesn't mean that you can wait that long for your management practices, but that is when you, you can probably expect most of the infections uh, to come in. So, you know, practical, what does this mean? Well, if you had a rain event at 30% bloom, probably not that significant, but if you have a rain event at petal fall, um, you should be scared. Okay, that that's kind of a that's kind of a significance of this. So you can you can see how this is, you know, we're sampling flowers out there. And this is the summary of about a dozen orchards down in Bartlett pear orchards down in California. And you can see like, when do we find it? Well, we're not actually really finding it very readily until we're getting closer to petal fall. And in some of the graphs, you can see uh, two lines. And the upper line was where we just put a delayed dormant oil on the trees for, for mites or, or whatever, and or scylla or whatever. And the line below it is where we also added copper. So this is what the delayed dormant copper is doing for you. It's not doing a lot, but it is pushing those curves out a little bit. So if you push those curves out a little bit, you have a few 
less susceptible flowers when the populations start to come up. Does that make sense? Right? Okay. Another thing we, I like to talk about, I'm gonna show you some charts in a second. And I, I, I've got bacteria on a log scale and, and a log scale is powers of 10. So if like on the bottom there, there's a two on the Y axis, right? He, whoops, uh, on the Y axis right here, that's a two. That means 10 times 10 or, or 100, okay? And if I go up here to the top, that, that's a six. That means 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10. So six, 10, 10, six times, that's a million, okay? And years and years ago, this is even older data, we individually washed flowers in trials where we had some treatments on, and we looked at what, how many Erwinia bacteria were in the flowers. And then we looked, correlated that with the infection that we saw in the, in the orchard flock. And we got where it says biological one and biological two there, we got really good control, like 90% control of infection. Uh, which you can see if we look at that five across there, which is 100,000 bacterial cells in a flower, we had very few flowers that had more than 100,000 cells in it, okay? And we got really good control of infection. We had lots and lots of flowers where we had lower numbers, uh, but they weren't, there wasn't our, our, how we interpret this was with that wasn't a sufficient number of numbers to infect the flower, that you need you need some number like 100,000 to a million cells of the fire blight pathogen on a flower to have a reasonable chance at infecting the flower, okay? So why is this important? Well, this is how we look at a lot of these materials now in terms of what have you actually accomplishing when you spray this stuff, okay? Uh, and so that, that's why I spent a little time with that. All right, so here's a chart I just kind of made up the other day and we're talking about organic programs now and why it's challenging, right? And so I've got three categories up at the top, significantly reduced pathogen numbers in the flowers. Okay, that's number one. Good infection suppression, that's number two. Very low potential to mark fruit, okay? So if we go across the top and we get, uh, we get you know, with antibiotics, we get three cherries, like ding, 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 it works. They're so good, right? So they give us good suppression of pathogen numbers on the flowers, good infection suppression, and they're fruit safe, all right? We can look at all the other materials that we have in our, that are available to us in organics, and I can't make uh, three, three check marks go across the line on any one of those materials, okay? And there's a tendency that if the material works really well, like I think coppers work pretty well, Blossom Protect works really well, uh, alum is not registered, but it works pretty well. But we get over here and we look at, are they completely fruit safe? It's hard to say they are, okay? So there's, there's some fruit marking risk with the materials that work pretty well, okay? So that, that's, that's a thing. If we look at what I call bacillus biorationals, which would be like your serenades and things like that, um, they don't mark fruit, but and they do have activity, but um, it's sort of so-so eh, eh, activity. Like when we, I'll show you some charts in the next slide here. This kind of is true with essential oils. It's true with the oxidizers. It's certainly true with the phage. We don't think the phage work at all. It was the lowest rank there in uh, Tiana's data. Um, and, and so on. And so, um, so when it comes to making a program for organic control is that you got to kind of pick and choose here on this chart for, and put your timings on at the right time in order to get the most out of the material with the least risk that you're going to mark the fruit. Okay. And, and that, so in terms of questions I get asked about organic control of fire blight, I think 90% of them would, I could, go back to this chart and we, I could say, this is where most of my questions come from, all right? Okay. Um, so here's some of these charts, all right? So here's those numbers on the side again. So remember, uh, one would mean 10, two would mean 200, three would mean 1,000 and so on. You know, if we don't do anything, this is the water, what we call the water control here, that's 10 million, all right? We are gonna have a lot of infection if there's 10 million cells on a flower. If we look at what antibiotics do, well, antibiotics have got us down in this 100 to 1,000 range. It's really good. It's really powerful, right? And then we can kind of go across here. Well, this is Previsto at three quarts. It's pretty good. This is Cueva at three quarts. It's not as good because there's not as much copper there, right? Um, 
here's alum. This is alum at uh, uh, 16 pounds. It's a, I mean, it's a lot of material. And this is alum at eight pounds. This is the one that we would be looking at. We call it the 1% alum. It's pretty good. Uh, it's also still quite a bit of material. Uh, then we can look over here. We've got like uh, oxidizers, lime sulfurs. Mm, they're all, they, they do some value. They have some value for protection, but they don't really clean bacteria off a tree very well. All right. Um, here's uh, the serenades, double nickels, prevent. There's about 10 of these things out there. They don't uh, take bacteria off trees very well. All right. Uh, Here's phage, they don't do anything. Uh, different different phage materials. And here's one I think from, from last year is kind of a mix of things, but you know, they're all, you know, the water, it, the water is this one. I think that's phage is actually worse than the water. Um, you know, and so this is this is what we look at. And so why do you ask, why do we recommend what we recommend? Well, this this is this is one of the primary reasons for me. What are we accomplishing uh, in taking bacteria off of trees? Okay. And uh, uh, and so th this has been important for me to understand all these materials. And I've got more charts. You probably wouldn't want to see them, but I've got more and more and more. <laughs> so uh, anyway, and then we look at uh, control and um, things that work. And I think Tiana had basically some of the same information, but you know, antibiotics over here are, are pretty effective. What we see with Blossom Protect is that it's pretty effective but it doesn't do anything to those populations on the flowers, but it protects the flowers from infection. So that's a really been a real curiosity for us. Um, other things that work pretty well, here's a copper, this is Previsto, um, again, Cueva, not quite as good, you know, and, and other things here, this is Serenade, this is Lime Sulfur, this is uh, the Oxidate material. You, you get little less efficacy with, with these materials, you know, as I say. So I, in my boxes on that one chart I had, I didn't say they didn't work, but I didn't say they work great, right? So that, that's, a, that's kind of a key. And this is, <laughs> I put my technician up there, Todd, uh, that we would grow these little popcorn trees for fire blight trials. You would never want to grow a tree like that if you were growing apples, but they work really good for fire blight. So, uh, all right. Um, so here's that chart again. So you know, in terms of what we think work really well, we, you know, Blossom Protect works really well. And you're going to see this one. Kind of, we think the coppers are really good at taking down numbers of bacteria on tree, on the tree. Other stuff like this isn't registered and, and lime sulfur is kind of so-so in that. But then as we get out closer to uh, petal fall, where we're starting to worry more about what's our potential to mark the developing fruit that are there, well, then we want to choose things in this category here where there's very low potential to mark fruit. Okay, that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of sequencing these materials. So um, so the optimal sequence. So I guess I've spent a number of years now on this opti optimal sequence question. And so some number of years ago, we figured out that if we put on uh, uh, biologicals twice or if we put on an antibiotic twice, we get a certain level of control, which is kind of intermediate. But if we put on a biological, then an antibiotic, we got better control, all right? So that's kind of our logic to, to how we wanted to design programs for organic management. Um, and so our interpretation sort of back in the day was, uh, well, the biologicals are gonna grow on the stigmas as, as Tiana was talking about, and the, and the chemicals that we come in with later in bloom are gonna fill up that floral cup and make it hard to get an infection, okay? I think that's still pretty sound logic, except when we, the biologicals we were working with back in the time were these like bloom time biological and A5, like band 506 and so on. And they really do just exclusively grow on stigmas. But now we have Blossom Protect and Blossom Protect grows on stigmas and it also grows in the floral cup, okay? So it's, it's sort of a broader spectrum type of biological. Um, so this is my slide. Most of you have probably seen this slide. Um, I update it a little bit every year. If you wanna take a picture of it, I also have it, have it at the end. Um, but this would be the program uh, that, that I, we think works, okay? Um, and so it, it's sort of like, you know, if you had blight in the orchard last year, that, that delayed dormant copper is a good idea. If you didn't have blight in the orchard last year, it's not a good idea. 
Um, lime sulfur thinning, if you're doing it early, fits better in a fire blight program than later, uh, in particular with how you use the yeast. We think the yeast should go on about 80% bloom. Uh, I don't think you have a lot of choice in that most years. It's not one of, it's sort of like, this is a strategic decision. I want to use the yeast. I'm going to put it on at 80% bloom and I'm going to use it. And then when you get into full bloom and, and petal fall, uh, if, you, if you're going to use copper, and, and I, I'd say copper is a good idea, it's better to put the copper on early in full bloom than in late in full bloom, all right? It, it has a bigger bang on the, back, on the pathogen, on the bacteria of the pathogen early in bloom, and it's less risk of marking fruit early in bloom. If you wait till the end, you have less bang on the pathogen and you, have, and you increase your risk of marking fruit. And then uh, our choice material at petal fall would be something like Serenade, Serenade Opti or Serenade ASO, which is the liquid formulation. We used the liquid formulation last year and I was pretty impressed with it. And I, I think it gives you a little bit more rate flexibility than the Opti does. Um, so if anybody, I don't know if it's, if it costs more, I don't, I don't know anything about the price of it, but I was pretty impressed with that liquid formulation of Serenade last year in terms of how it went on. We were just using it at three quarts and I was, I liked what we saw with it at, and, and I think you can go up to four quarts with it. So something to think about. All right. Um, so Blossom Protect, we've heard all about it. This, um, this picture, Tiana had that picture. So here's Quan again. Quan's an up and comer in fire blight research. So I sort of challenged Quan this last summer. I said, Quan, how does Blossom Protect work? Tell me how it works. And he goes in the lab and field and comes out and um, he says it works because you know it, it doesn't really reduce the numbers of the pathogen on the flowers, right? So, but it's so good, it works so well. So what is it doing? So Quan goes in the lab and he comes back and says, can it, uh, whoops, it, it induces resistance in the flowers, just like say Actigard would do it. And in fact, on the chart on the side over there, uh, the little, this is the control, the red boxes are Actigard sprayed on the flower uh, and the green boxes are blossom protect sprayed on the flower. And, he, and, and he's looking at those PR proteins that, that Tiana mentioned, which are defense proteins, which are markers of that you're inducing resistance on the tree. Um, and it's, it's pretty remarkable. But so if you go back, but we think that this colony of yeast cells sitting on a floral cup does is that it's doing something there that causes this defense gene expression in the flowers and then makes it so that the fire blight pathogen can infect it. It's pretty amazing. I, I think that if you want to pay attention to fire blight research in the next, say, 10 years, you're going to see a whole lot more on this topic because it's pretty interesting. Are there other things that can do this? Are there other agents that say wouldn't have a russet potential that can do this? Um, it, it's pretty interesting. All right. So anyway, that's Quan. I think you're going to see Quan again. He'll be out here one of these days. So he's got a lot of energy. <laughs> anyway, um, so here's kind of my take home of, my, of that program thing that I was talking about. And then I think I'll just wrap it up. Um, this is a lot of data. So this is 10 trials. All right. So 10 trials uh, done in different years over a number of years. And again, we're looking at just what's the number of bacterial cells that are in the flowers, right? And remember, here's that sort of that threshold number, that, uh, that 100,000 per flower, that's kind of the, the number we need on a flower to get infection is, is somewhere in this area. So if we don't do anything and we just have water on the tree, that's our line, right? And these two gray ones here are, are the blossom protect. And you can see the Blossom Protect's pretty good at giving us control of infection, but it's not very good at doing anything to the bacteria on the tree, okay? But, um, but so, so here we are, we're now, now we're getting to full bloom. And so let's say now we've put Blossom Protect on the tree here, and now we wanna go to Serenade, and then we wanna go to Copper. So this would be a full bloom Serenade and a Petal Fall Copper or if we want to go to a full bloom copper and a petal fall serenade, right? So blossom protect, serenade, copper, blossom protect, copper, and serenade. And you can see 
that um, if we go blossom protect copper serenade, we're getting numbers down here that are closer to streptomycin, all right? So it's the key. It's the key to this thing, okay? Put that copper on shortly after full bloom. It gets you away from russeting risk, marking risk, uh, and it has a bigger bang than it does if you put it on late, okay? All right, so. This is a lot of data, but I don't just want to highlight one thing here. Um, so this would be the efficacy of these various programs. It's the same data from the last slide, but it, it's just different ending things here. But generally, if we went Blossom Protect and Previsto and then something else, it could be any of these things here, we get really high control that is pretty comparable to antibiotics. Uh, if we go Blossom Protect and Serenade, then one of these other things here, then the control drops off quite a bit, right? So um, that's that's kind of the take home here. So if when you see when you see this chart, uh, the chart is you know, blossom protect full bloom. Our number one recommendation there at full bloom, right at for full bloom, would be to put the provisto on, and then as you get later into bloom, put on serenade or or something else that you think works better. Okay, this is the last chance for pictures. <laughs> All right. And the other thing about we did, you know, I'll just back up one here. You ready? You got it? Uh, we did some russeting work on this, you know, in a couple of years with, and I probably should have done more, but russeting is, uh, but you can see that, you know, this was really missed time Blossom Protect, putting it on really late. We marked up some pairs with Blossom Protect pretty late. Uh, this was lime sulfur on pairs. Don't do it. Really marks them up. Um, let's see what else we got going up here a little bit. Well, that's that. That's alum a little bit. Alum. I, I just, I don't know. I'm just skeptical that alum, I think alums, we're going to talk about using alum like we use Previsto as a kind of full bloom treatment. Uh, so down here on apples now, uh, Fuji's Blossom Protect marked them a little bit. Lime sulfur didn't. In fact, they were the best looking fruit in the whole whole thing. So this was serenade and lime sulfur. So lime sulfur at petal fall uh, looked pretty good. Um, blossom Protect again. Again, these are missed time Blossom Protects. This is like a petal fall Blossom Protect. I don't know how late you want to go with Blossom Protect. I really like that 80%. But again, serenade, then lime sulfur, then Previsto, then lime sulfur. Pretty clean fruit. All right, so um, you can see why why I why I've got this this slide. So I'll I'll stop it right there. We we can open up for questions. Yeah.